Welcome to the fifth and final Urban Age debate of this current cycle, focusing on rationalizing shopping, our new patterns of consumption and opportunity for reinventing urbanity. The Urban Age debate series is organized by LSE Cities, the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft, and the LSE School of Public Policy. My name is Philip Rode, and I'm the Executive Director of LSE Cities, and I will co-chair the next 60 minutes with Jonathan DeMello, who is equity partner at the retail consultancy, uh, CWM. On behalf of both of us, a very warm welcome to our three panelists, Thomas Heatherwick, the designer and founder of Heatherwick Studio, Andrew Murphy, who is Executive Director of Operations at the John Lewis Partnership, and Eva Westermark, an architect and partner at Gale Architects in Copenhagen. LSE Cities will be live tweeting during the event, and if you want to join the discussions on Twitter, the hashtag is Urban Age Debates. This event uh, is being live streamed on YouTube uh, through our Urban Age channel and will then be made available as a podcast uh, from then on. We're going to structure our discussion into three rounds. They will be rapid and quite uh, fast moving. Round one will focus on COVID-19 as accelerator of urban retail change with questions about e-commerce, experience retail, and maybe a revival of independent shops. Round two will shift to peak stuff from Black Friday to the new awareness of the social and environmental costs of consumerism. And then in round three, we really bring it back to the city, a meaningful urban marketplace, question mark, can the public space function of retail be reinvented? Please make use of the Q&A throughout. We hope to take about one to two questions for each of the rounds, but adding your views and question comments will also help to broaden the perspectives throughout as they can be seen by everyone. So you should have the QO, a QA button readily available. Let me now hand over to Jonathan for the first round. Jonathan, over to you. Hi everyone. Um, so the first round is COVID-19 is an accelerator of urban retail chains and so, what I'm going to cover with this short introduction before I hand over to the panelists is really the fact that COVID has catalyzed e-commerce considerably over the past couple of years that we've had COVID and the lockdowns that we've seen. So e-commerce penetration globally has risen from 14% in 2019 to 20% in 2021, but that actually masks the fact that some markets have never had a, a developed e-commerce platform. So the likes of the US, the UK and European markets have seen a doubling in e-commerce spend actually over the last two years. Um, in terms of spend, people have been spending their money on new laptops, monitors, they've been working from home, so all the products that are involved in terms of working from home. DIY garden products have been very um, bought, you know, bought considerably as well by these individuals and also Netflix subscriptions too. So we've seen a lot of spend increases in certain categories to the detriment of others. But you know, online grocery spend has actually doubled too. And this grocery represents 50% of all of our spend collectively, typically, especially in certain more developed markets. You know, that doubling has led to huge logistical pressures on the ability to deliver. This is why it's hard to get a slot sometimes, you know, when you're looking to get home delivery of groceries. And so that has created logistical pressures and, you know, the demise of department stores globally, administrations, you know, lots of retailers falling by the wayside has led to big vacancies on our high streets. And so I guess, one of the things that we're going to be exploring as part of this is what does that mean for the high street? We've seen repurposing of space from retail to converted to offices, residential, even logistics. What does that mean for cities going forwards? And, you know, even though physical sales have started to bounce back, we are seeing a sea change in the way that our high streets and our malls and our cities are, are these days, you know, from a retail perspective. So it's really just to hand over to the panelists to discuss this. So we're going to start with Andrew to give a retailer perspective. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe try and put some dimensions around the, the shift as, as we see it. But just to maybe start with one of the fundamentals is that this is, a, this is an economic challenge for the retail business model. Um, it will only reverse if somebody uninvents the internet. That seems unlikely on balance. And therefore, we, we should take the consequences of it as being somewhat absolute. So an example of that would be the oversupply of retail space in towns and city centres in Western developed economies is an absolute. It, it will not change 
um, there is simply no need for that amount of physical retail space. And so for all retailers, you have a choice. You can try and repurpose that space within your own business model to add sufficient value to offset its cost, or you can start to close some or all of it. Uh, and to give you an idea about how that works is one of the department stores that's, uh, that's imperiled uh, in the UK. We're now the only national department store. 60% of our sales are online uh, uh, now compared to 42, 43% pre-pandemic. Um, having said that, and having closed 16 of our 51 shops during the pandemic, so basically being two thirds of the physical size that we were, our sales are plus 2% 2021 versus 2019. And that what that tells you is that um, if, the, if the overall business model is healthy, the switch to online does not mean that retail as an industry is disappearing. It is simply a format change and a form change. And so when we think about what does that mean for uh, urban space, it has to mean less probably owed by retailers, less of what is there being for the direct function of transactional retail. But it doesn't mean that retail shouldn't be present. But I strongly suspect what we'll see is a much more um, uh, mixed mash and blend of retail, residential, hospitality, uh, event space, et cetera. And indeed, you're already beginning to see this in the big global cities uh, and in um, larger town centres. I do think there's a challenge, however. I don't think that will be as easy an economic um, or physical proposition to get um, uh, sustainably established in smaller towns. I think when we think about this, I think we need to think about different scales in that sense. Thanks very much. Well, we'll move on to Eva now to get her views on this. Yes, so thank you, Andrew. I think I can continue where you left off. Um, with this interesting uh, topic of scales and different places that people need. Like we at Gale, we look at maybe not so much where people are spending money, but where they're spending time. So uh, during COVID, we could really see this shift in that some environments like the retail streets that are more monofunctional, like the city centers, traditional use, they are hurting badly, and we all saw that, we experienced it. But the places that had more of a robust mix of uses that already, because of course this trend, trend was just accelerated during COVID, it started long before that. Um, so we could see that those cities that had really invested in adding more everyday functions to the city centers, like layering things, uh, bringing back schools, uh, adding playgrounds, thinking also recreation and nature as part of the city center, they were more robust uh, because they had a wider, uh, wider reasons for people to come. Um, so that's like one trend we can see in the city centers where I think we have to even fur go further in the future, um, but also that we need to concentrate the city centers, like shorten the walking streets, layering these functions on top of each other uh, three-dimensionally, and, and also using time to think how users can, can shift over the day, over the week, over the, the month or the year. So that's like one really strong tendency that we have to, uh, our cities have to adapt to and our planners and our, our uh, private sectors. Um, and the other, tendency is the opposite then, that we could see that people were spending so much more time in their local neighborhoods and, and connected to the everyday use and that the shrinking, maybe we went from not even a 15 minute city, but the two minute city, the five minute city, like it got really, really local. And I think that that's another opportunity where the retail uh, actors like whether or not we go online and buy things there's always a place where we receive the goods whether that's picking it up at the local supermarket or close to home there's always a place so i'm thinking that there is a great opportunity for retail like the private sector and retail actors to become more think about place making retail so what can you do to actually help the local community to become more attractive, uh, to, to be able to support um, authentic, authentic places, um, 
So tapping into the needs of a local community in, in a stronger way, because thinking of that chain, uh, trying to control the full shopping experience, of course, that receiving the package is, is also part of that experience. And so that to me presents like a great opportunity to do, to move both ways, like both strengthen the city centers and become more robust and more connected to everyday life, but also really focusing on the neighborhood scale and see how we can tap into this authentic identity and strengthen communities. Let's see from Thomas now. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, well, in a way, I think what I'm going to be saying is building on what Eva was talking about. Um, it feels like we had all these public bits of of our country with all the towns and cities that the vast proportion of people are in, dominated lazily in a way by, by places that the retailers felt like they were essential infrastructure. So they could sit there, if they'd muscled their way on and they sold tights or they sold um, your medicine or whatever that was, they, they, they could be there and get away with being, uh, with being sort of above and people were below. And the, accel the acceleration of what's happened with COVID really pushing the online uh, shopping side is that it feels that we, lazy placemaking can't happen anymore. And that suddenly we have to think really of emotion as a function. And that's something that I've been interested in for a very long time as to how we spoke about functionalism, about this is functional placemaking, functional, and seemed to forget that emotion was a function. And now it's really leapt forward that it's really thinking about human motivation. Why do you go somewhere? How many steps? What, what boredom is a thing that we don't really talk about enough, I don't think. And, and in streets and the work that Jan Gehl did and, and that Eva does is really understanding how you feel when you move around a place. And, and I've just got more and more interested in, in that. And I've, I find it incredible how insensitively most places have been being made uh, up until very, very, very recently. Um, it's also then interesting when we think about what's the role of shopping places, I think, shops have been too big for too long. So you walk along a street and you're kind of walking past these big places and that means you, they're expensive because they're big. And the, the, the more smaller places you can get, the more a place becomes interesting and engages your emotion and your senses. So I think that's the, the screeching halt for people suddenly they've got to really get involved with emotion. But then I think the, uh, we, with digital, I mean, it felt like everyone was rushing to, to the online world, but it's a pretty packed place to be. If I was to tomorrow try and start something and do it online as to selling things to people and connecting, it, it, how do you stand out online? So I think moving from the essential infrastructure, suddenly if I'm on physical, I know how you grab people's attention and connect with people emotionally. So I think that the retail has become uh, media, in fact. So it's suddenly, it's a way to connect with people it physically. Uh, separate from experience, it sort of, it jumps and grabs your emotion in the physical in a way that the flat, shiny screen, whatever you put on it, doesn't connect in that way. So I'm, I'm interested in multiple different dimensions here and what a huge gap there is for an emotion as function led placemaking. Some really good points there by everybody. And uh, I think we're now gonna go into a discussion on those points, Philip. Absolutely. And I wanna come back to Andrew uh, and uh, I would be, I'm curious to see how, what's your response, what you have heard from the designers in this panel, in particular what Thomas just said about the physicality creates almost like a, a local monopoly for uh, connecting with people, uh, with local people. Uh, and that, uh, that's may, that may be more powerful than we are currently thinking. If we're looking at the statistics, which you 
so powerfully presented up front. Uh, Andrew, back to you. Thanks, Philip. I, I think philosophically, many retailers are in exactly the same place when it comes to the concept and, uh, of placemaking and the desire to play a, a positive part in that. Um, the, 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 the sad and difficult truth is that the economics of retail currently have it as a very low margin, not to say also a, quite a low wage industry. And so the, I guess the encouragement I would give to um, you know, designers, architects, um, civic leaders, et cetera, is to recognize that if you see retail as part of your experience and service mix for the inhabitants of a town and city, be aware that the economics of retail will very much limit and define what the retailers feel able to contribute. And whatever vision we might have, shared vision we might have for the future, the cost of change is significant. And so we, we, we have to be very hard-headed about this. Um, and the number of shop closures that you see happening isn't a result of people just giving up and deciding they'd rather do something else. It's an economic consequence. And so I'm very much an advocate for bringing that strong and enriching philosophy together with the economic and operational reality of the industry that we currently think of as, as retail. Thank you very much. Uh, we're seeing a lot of comments here uh, popping up on chat. Do contribute, do also uh, highlight those which you like to be answered. I'll come back to them in a moment. Uh, Eva, uh, maybe a response again to, to Thomas's provocation to let's move beyond uh, the, the functionalism in a traditional sense and, and embrace the emotional uh, as part of a fundamental function. Oh, I mean, I'm 100% uh, with that thinking. Uh, just, just imagine like how the question, how do we design empathic spaces or spaces that makes people be more empathic to other people? And I think that um, if we see how the public life has changed over the course of the last 100 years, before we had like the majority of, of life in our street was necessary. It was actually doing trading goods and it was needing to be out there. And then we had this huge shift of optional activities. So we only spend time in the street or in the public space if we, if we like it, uh, because it's optional. We don't need to. We can actually sit in our homes by ourselves, buying things, connecting with people. So suddenly the public spaces need to be attractive. They need to be safe in order for people to even use them. And that's where the, all the emotions come in. Of course, it's about emotions, about feeling safe, about feeling included, about meeting other people. So I think that um, um, like emotion as a function is, is right on spot in terms of how we have to think about space. Um, and just to add to that in terms of what Andrew just said, that uh, what is maybe interesting then in this trajectory from necessary activity to optional activity is that now we can see a need to combine the two again. So having like adding these uh, necessary activity, going to school, going to work, everything we do every day, we have to combine that with the, the, the destination spaces in order for them to be robust. So we're sort of doing, I think, coming back to a full circle, but really, I'm, I'm, I think that the emotion as a function is, is a very good um, way to describe it. And it's not at all fuzzy or, uh, you know, it's, it's hardcore, real stuff we have to deal with. Thank you, Eva. And I want to come back to, to Thomas, who uh, set us up around uh, this, this track of thinking. Uh, linking on the one hand to what Eva said earlier about the localization uh, of retail, some people even refer to the hyper-localization, the things coming closer, the physical things closer to where we live, where we have our life worlds. And I want to also connect it to John uh, of Hugh's comments in the chat, where he notes that uh, the next uh, sort of obvious thing to do with available space that may have been retail until recently is to convert it into residential. And that's, of course, a big debate in planning in many countries at the moment. Um, Thomas, what, what about this relationship where you live and where you shop, where you live, where you have retail uh, and the proximity? Is that needed for the 
sort of emotional function which you alluded to, or is it actually absolutely doable even if it remains a re more remote or inner city district where you do uh, go about your shopping and retail activities? I suppose I'm not thinking of this as a shopping conversation. I'm thinking of this as a public life conversation. And this, uh, uh, I've always found it, I always found it funny in the world of architecture that the premium project for uh, a designer of buildings was an art museum because that was culture. And, and I just always found that really funny because I thought, well, where are most people? It's on the streets. And the, so I found it for me that the a thing we call shopping has been a way that we see each other. How do we come together? Where else? We thought that we would all see each other online and that online was this great place where everyone would be. And then we discovered that the algorithms didn't let us really see each other. And, and the, the, the fantastic um, unexpected things that real public life should be layering. Um, and so how, how do we really allow us to see each other? There was this wrong construct that shopping and councils thought shopping and developers thought shopping is culture, is public life. And in a way there's, it's both terrible and some kind of relief to say, no, it isn't because we were pushing out and we're working in Nottingham at the moment, in the center of the city, where there is a, a shopping mall that failed, that was built in the 70s. And it's that big thing squeezed out. The, where are the older people? Where are the younger, the really early years, later years? And so you get public life squeezed and isolated all around the edge, and then we don't see it. And then we're surprised when everyone votes for Brexit things like that. So I suppose going to Andrew's point, I think we shouldn't give up on how important that public life space is and how much we need to see each other physically because there's something you can trust about that that an algorithm isn't controlling. I guess I, I'm not the world's expert on this, but things like business rates for, for, for shopping spaces, we probably need the government to find some way to, to, to tax in, in on the online world and to incentivize the street world because at the moment it's penalized and, and it's powerful what Andrew was just saying. And so that we can breathe more life. And so in Nottingham and our project, we, we half of this shopping mall building was already demolished. And we're, we're at this early pre-visioning sort of visioning stage. And our first thing was stop, stop demolishing the rest of it. Because to Andrew's point about economy, there isn't money. But so if you knock it all down, you're going to, what are you building from zero in such precious heart of a town? But instead we can mine that existing structure. It's in a sense, turn it into a, our blessing that we're getting and all the carbon you would be washing away and having to get going all over again to muster up new shiny neutral structures and how can we fold back the the flour mill the boxing club and overlay as much as possible the things that normally don't see each other because i think whether we realize it or not we're hungry to see each other and that clumsy shopping world that was what councils thought and what everyone thought that just pushed all the other life out this is our opportunity to put it back in maybe it's still too big but let's give it a chance but we need government to support that chance thank you very much thomas and uh, we will have to centrally return to uh, this question you put on the table uh, in the second half of the debate but we need to do one important detour we can't avoid the question and you already mentioned carbon, uh, a code for a much bigger issue also when it comes to the retail economy. So back over to Jonathan to introduce the second round. Yes, yeah, so this uh, second round is about peak stuff, essentially the awareness of the social and environmental costs of consumerism. So I guess starting out this introduction, um, some sectors like fashion over the years have seen significant price deflation is almost has been a race to bottom in the sense that 
you know, it's all about cutting prices, fast fashion, value. Primark has come to the fore in that sense, you know, and it's one of the most popular retailers in the UK and globally, in fact, these days. Um, because of that, it's obviously, you know, this rise of fast fashion, disposable items, it's led to lower quality products in general. And as such, it's had an environmental cost with, you know, obviously increased consumerism, but more importantly, wastage. So the low quality of these products means you have to replace them more often because they fade, you know, they go out in the wash, et cetera. So, you know, fast fashion now accounts for about 2.1 billion tons of CO2 emissions, which is crazy and it's growing as more and more people want disposable fashion. Um, there's a human cost too, you know, so maintaining those low prices has led to sourcing in extremely undeveloped countries. And that sourcing has led to, you know, essentially low wages, poor working conditions, and the things we saw in Bangladesh, you know, over the course of a number of different factory fires, we've seen 1,300 people die in Bangladesh as a result of sourcing from that particular market. So, you know, it's been really a race to the bottom in terms of cost and therefore passing that lower cost onto the consumer. There's also e-waste or electronic waste, you know, that's led to 57 million tons of wastage worldwide in that sector. And only 17% of that's properly recycled according to the UN. So, you know, the byproduct of e-waste, like mobile phones and all the rest of it, has led to mercury being released into the atmosphere, which is harmless, uh, harmful to human life. Um, and the final thing to mention on online is 30% of online orders are returned versus 6% in store. So if that's the case, and if you look at how much that's been returned, 20% of that actually ends up in landfill because the retailers online aren't able to resell the product. So that's another big impact on the environment right there. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the first panelist, which is going to be Andrew again on this one. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> um, I think the, the, the starting point of the conversation around fashion is important. And I think when we think ultimately about our built environment, retail's presence, how it shows up there, we have to be really conscious of that as, a, as an end-to-end -end, um, process that is much longer and more complex than the retail front part. Um, strange to think, but fashion used to be measured almost generationally. Certainly, a, a fashion would be something of a number of years, not a number of months. And it's very difficult then to disconnect this conversation from what people want. And I think particularly and probably a, a vulnerability of our conversation today is that we don't have anybody under 20 years old contributing to the conversation. It's very, very easy for a group of middle-aged people to pontificate about what's good, what's bad, what can be done, what's attractive. In my experience, people under 20 have quite a different view of that than people who 40, 50 years old and are now in the positions of power to run retailers and um, design buildings and, and streetscapes. Um, recycling, rental uh, of product, reuse, subscription models, all these things are, are happening and, and will undoubtedly grow. Um, I think in many ways, they're the less controversial end of this conversation and possibly the, the less difficult to adapt to. I think the role of the car in town centres is um, an unresolved problem. And I've never yet met a local authority that doesn't engage in some acts of self-harm as it attempts to um, appease its social conscience on the one hand and have a thriving community in the city centre on the other. And the, and the anti-car lobby have a lot to answer for. The answer can't be to not have cars. The answer has to be for it to be proportionate and clean. And it feels like progress is being made on that front. But um, I can't overstate how important car-borne customers are to most retailers, um, not just because of the convenience, but also because if we want people to have their vacuum cleaner repaired, and we want that to happen in an urban environment, then we have to enable the vacuum cleaner to be brought back to the store. And um, just to give that as one, one example. Final point, every endeavour I've ever been involved in to improve uh, city centre life, city centre economy, the built environment, there are four actors who constantly have to be brought together and who typically struggle to align governments, local authority, the space users, and the landlords and any conversation about meaningful change and um, positive evolution for our town and city centres has to start and end with those four groups aligned and that's often no easy thing to do. 
Thanks very much, Angie. Let's move on to Thomas and hear his views on this. Um, well, I, I think that we, this, it's about bringing the streets alive. And I think that there are organizations who are hidden around us. And at one example, and it's about bringing them to the street. And, and so there is, I, I think that, um, my brain's going in two different directions. So one side is about, as Andrew said, the, the culture of repairing things and, and not just having to uh, always throw away. And, and high, a street used to have repair was one of the things that was on the street, repairing shoes, repairing clothes. And, those, the, and it's not just about the literal repair, there's about relationships. And I think we need to talk about how the street starts to, to move to relationships and exchange, not just exchange of money for a thing, but exchange of services on that street, not just things, and exchange of emotional connections with people, which is, I think, one of the joys of urban living or, or town living or even village living is those exchanges for your mental health as and that uh, that grow us each and make us feel integrated into something um but i the the uh, the other side was there are so many organizations who have lost their connection to us all and one example is when i was little i went into i was taken in by my one of my parents into a place on the Haymarket down from Lily White's in Piccadilly Circus to a place called the Design Centre. And the Design Centre was where the Design Council was. And I walked into this place and it, it, they didn't charge you to go into the door. And there was a plan for a new city being built, the city of Milton Keynes. There was a new kind of knitting machine. There was a robotic arm that used no electricity. Uh, and there were uh, devices for your home. And, things, and I, that's how I knew. I, I walked in there and that's how I knew that that's what I was. And uh, I was a designer. That's what. And uh, I used to go back in as a teenager. If you're in the West, then you could just pop in. And for all sorts of reasons to do with cost cutting, that it, it's about 25 years ago, it got taken away from the high street. And there's someone I know who can justify proudly how they saved on all the salaries of it being on the street but it, it meant that the little me's the little teenage the kids and teenagers how do we know how do, how do we connect if all we have is clothes shopping uh, and there are so many there's a women's organization that we're working with they they my i've sort of become any organization i speak to it's like can we bring you to the ground how do we and we're working on a London street where we're designing the whole of one side of a street and a major pedestrian route, the whole side. It's, ridic it's ridiculous to, to be thinking at scale when it, it used to be made incrementally and how to think while thinking at scale, how to make sure we stay incremental in emotion, um, but how we breathe the life and changes necessary in every few footsteps necessary to make somewhere that comes alive but I, I think that we are so stuck even thinking we are all so programmed to think that high streets are jammed full of stuff you buy and I think that we can there's a real opportunity to to rethink that um, and and still give business to Bangladesh and still give business to other places in the world it's not either or Fully agree with that. Um, I'll pass on to Eva. Thank you. Uh, there's so many things um, that spark my mind when you when I hear you speak. Um, what, one thing about doing this: how do we do this transformation that we need to do? That everyone knows, like we have this sense of urgency, we have to address. And of course, that's all uh, a good uh, incentive for change when you have a sense of urgency. But change making starts through doing things differently. Um, so what do we have to do differently? I think one thing is addressing this. You said lazy placemaking, Thomas, but I think also like 
just a complete, maybe it's the same thing, but really lazy use of space. Like we have to use what we have already so much more efficient and better. And that goes for everything. But if we take the street as an example, just to be very concrete and, and coming back to this topic that is always the hot potato, the parking, you know, um, I mean, you may be surprised to hear this from a Gale person, but I kind of like a parking space, not because it's for a parked car, but it's so defined as a space. It's a small unit. It's like two times five meters or something like that, uh, 10 square meters. And just illustrating what you could do with that. How hard can that space actually work in terms of delivering quality uh, and, and, and creating a more sustainable environment? And most of you might have heard about these parklet uh, movement that we have seen in many cities. It started in San Francisco as parking day, like just uh, paying uh, the meter on a parking spot and turning, tur turning it into a park, so public space. And then that then uh, has transformed into a city-led um, initiative that you can have, have two parking spaces transformed locally. All of them are different. So it's a public-private partner uh, public -private partnership. So the shop owner or the landowner can actually contribute to turning this like super tight space into something where it's actually working much harder. So maybe you keep one parking space or on the each side, but they should also be working much harder. So not having a parked car, like really short term, making sure that every space is used in its absolute optimum way. So I think that's part of this transformation of thinking of how can we reduce waste? How can we increase use? And, and at the same time, stim making uh, um, stimul stimuli for people to meet, like the social dimension of this. And um, I think that one part is then the, the private sector, but then the public sector, how they have to, in order to address this, go from this two dimensional zoning to not three and maybe not four, but five dimensional zoning or five, five dimensional planning. So, can we layer functions for? Um, uh, horizontal, sorry, vertically, can we use time much more efficient in terms of thinking that into zoning and planning? And I think maybe the fifth dimension is then how we work together, like how do we collaborate? How do we get all these four key uh, parties that Andrew mentioned also working together to the same goal? So we really have to layer things. We have to, I think time is maybe the most underutilized asset we have in, in cities in order to get more out of what we already have, and then anchoring this into local needs and local context. So always making something very specific. Thanks, Steve. We'll pass on to Philip then to lead the debates around this particular topic. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to connect what we are again seeing in, in the chat. I mean, on the one hand, there's Christian, Bernard, who is uh, really emphasizing this question around, uh, do we really need uh, to produce uh, so much, I guess, but certainly what is it we really need to produce and emphasizes the broader sustainability uh, value and it got uh, sort of voted very much up. Uh, and I, I guess what we need to connect this with is then the second uh, highly rated question by, by Nicholas Falk, who reminds us uh, that a lot of investment is pretty much locked into an existing business uh, model. Uh, and it's starting to no longer pay back. Uh, and maybe let's start with Andrew. I mean, it was a bit of a footnote, Andrew, where you said, sure, there is something bubbling up around the repair and the maintenance economy and the more circular approach. But what are the maybe innovative pilots, even your own corporation is advancing that may provide an answer to Christian and Nicholas? Uh, and then for our designers, uh, if we are thinking once again around uh, places that offer repair and maintenance services, what are the spatial implications? Uh, is it different to the sort of one-off contact point handing over a product, which then uh, is going only one direction? But let's start with Andrew, innovative practices. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, the, um, the areas that we've been most uh, active in our uh, furniture rental, 
and in um, active recycling, where we're encouraging return of used products uh, to our stores or via online, um, sometimes for a discount on future pur purchases, sometimes not. And it's quite interesting to look at the different customer behaviours around, around those concepts. Um, a couple of points that I'd make about that and um, to, the, to the first of the two questions that you picked out. Um, to to re-engineer the business model of a very big retailer is no small thing. It takes time, but it also takes investment. And even if I was optimistic about the chose to be optimistic about the rate of growth of those models, and even if I envisaged that there over the next 10 years there was some um, aggressive help from legislators to push us in that direction to incentivize the consumer to make the economics easier. I would still struggle to see this representing more than 10 to 15 percent of our total business activity in a decade's time. Um, so there's there's a lot to be thought through there, compounded by the fact that change for any business is easier to deliver and cheaper to deliver in a digital environment than it is in a physical one. And so any time that you ask yourself the question, even if you started from a physical place making, uh, physical retail perspective, you might find yourself ending up at answers that are delivered digitally. And that's before we even let the, um, the word of the year metaverse into the conversation and start to think about what opportunities or distractions that, that may bring. So I think it's a really valid conversation. And I think eventually we will look back to the importance that some of the um, uh, viewers have commented on, which is there will be very few solutions that make sense on Oxford Street in London that also make sense in a small provincial town. And many of the examples that I hear put forward are quite polarised in that they would either only be possible with the weight of a big retailer behind them and others that really only make sense for uh, an owner operator with one door in one location who could potentially make a living themselves out of those options. Uh, and so I think we have to think in quite a discriminating way about some of the, the models and the opportunities that we, uh, that we propose. Thank you, uh, Andrew. So two very strong warnings, uh, not to be very focused on very exceptional high streets or inner city retail conditions. You mentioned Oxford Street and appreciate that the majority looks very different. And second, that uh, the physical retail is even more locked in and uh, maybe has even greater difficulties to transition than more fluid already uh, virtualized or half virtualized e-commerce. That essentially says to me that if we want to take sustainability uh, seriously, we would have to start the transition immediately in the physical context. And that's where I want to hand back to Thomas and Eva. If you had to really now transition to design for maintenance and repair economies, is it any different from the retail environments we know today? Or is it more or less the same? You just replace a repair shop with something that before was pure selling. Uh, are there any paradigmatic opportunities for designers to reinvent also the territory that shapes those activities? Yeah, so I think that it's a totally different mindset. Uh, like moving from thinking about my space to our space or thinking from like a one-way conversation through design to a dialogue. So how do we go from the monologue design to a dialogue design? Uh, it has to be less controlled, I think, in order to invite people to think of things being remade, being maintained, being um, not finished, uh, but actually always constantly in this circle. Um, and, and I think that, that is a really good opportunity to think of how do we address the our space or the our design, which what is different compared to actually being in control of the shop's interior? Like how do we make that connection? Um, and one of the ways is of course, tap into people's uh, needs and listen to people and, and, and understanding people's everyday life and, actually talking to 
people's needs. So let's say we have a repair place. I'm, I'm thinking of what you just said, Andrew, in terms of that, you know, we have to get the vacuum cleaner back to the store, but maybe there's opportunity to have something really local. So there's a need to create jobs locally. Uh, is there, there's a need on a personal level not to needing to carry this big thing or putting into the car, driving to the, the original store? Like how can we create uh, local meeting places, hubs um, in, in a neighborhood, on a neighborhood scale that can do all of these things? So how, how we put it into the system of this like place making, uh, regenerative design thinking that is much more about what's ours, what's common, than what's mine, what I'm selling to you. So it's how, how do we actually come together around that? But it looks differently, definitely. Thank you, Eva. T Thomas, do you agree? Is it very different? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, going back to that point about exchange, the street as a place of exchange rather than the street as a place of just selling, flogging stuff to people. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the street as a social theater, which means you need to start really by thinking of activities rather than thinking of just one one way traffic of buying from someone. And, and I think the I, I had a very powerful visit last week in I went to Reading and visited a project which is a cinema set up by the really local group and they also have a project in Catford in Lewisham and it was so interesting meeting the owner and being shown around because the they had got an inexpensive space and had focused not on lavish interior design not on bundles and bundles of consultants all clocking up their time and that they just boil down to the absolute essential of a of some cinema spaces some projectors just put plywood on the walls and it meant that i think a cine world ticket is 12 pounds 50 their their ticket to six pounds 50 and they've got loads of space so they don't have pressure to sell you a coffee they don't have pressure to rent that space to you. So there's public spaces with tables and seats, which is like a village hall. And it's to Andrew's point about how are we going to get the economics right? And I think less of the priority of how much bronze is there and what was the fancy this or that, but the, the luxury is the activity and the focus on the, the exchange and the social dimension for us all because the other thing is gentrification. And the more is how do you find something that can feel true for all of us, but not actually push a bunch of us out. I've got also interested um, with a, a new organization called Make Space for Girls. Uh, and, and I don't know if you, your, um, the listeners and viewers have, have know of them, but they, they were looking at how we look and in the world of design, and um, so there's all these things where you look at what's good public space. And you go, oh yeah, look, there's a skate park, and yeah, okay, look, there, there's um, there's skating going on, there's football and basketball going on. It's a great public space. And then you stop and say, well, how many girls are there in these spaces that you're saying are good public space? And that actually the girl numbers are very small. And so where boys feel safe and where girls feel safe is so different actually and we're ticking a success when it isn't really a success if it isn't space for girls so how do you design space for girls and if i flip that into my life with my daughter who's a teenager and then you see where does she feel safe she doesn't feel safe going to oxford street and wandering around the west end like i might have done or cycling around um, and then you get into another funny thing which we haven't spoken about yet is the privatized public spaces and so there's you know a lot of criticism put at uh, potential sort of cynical uh, creation of spaces but it's interesting when speaking to my daughter and her friends the for example in King's Cross the, the King's Cross development there they feel safe being there because because it's private space 
it means that there is they have a sense that they're safe because there's security in that space and that's another thing that things like the westfield big spaces have and uh so i think my interest is isn't buying and selling things it's how you make people actually have space where we see each other which the online doesn't do and um so i think that's that's very very interesting but i think gentrification and focus but is an issue but focusing on activity rather than um rather than luxury thomas that's very helpful and indeed almost a transition now to our final round here which also connects by Kasia Iyats and Monika Milenska's comments. They are both uh, really concerned and interested hearing more about, it's almost beyond retail, uh, around the public space function. And that is, of course, uh, the question we want to now really leave it with. How can we transition towards a meaningful urban market uh, place? Can retail ever again sort of embrace some of the public space qualities, which Many of us uh, know, of course, of certain markets and even in other parts of the world of, of bazaars. And how can physical uh, spaces that include retail remain inclusive? Or in other words, it, does inclusivity and commodification maybe rule out each other to some degree? Um, and finally, uh, if we are really designing for the next market places that have this public space qualities, which we have heard now from all of you, repeatedly, what are the, really the key objectives for the design of these places? And who are we designing for? This is a question I borrow from Thomas from our upfront conversation. Uh, who, who are we designing for in these cases? We'll take in this instance, our designers first uh, with Eva, Thomas, uh, and then almost have, have Andrew react to, to their propositions. Uh, so Eva, if I can invite you first and then Thomas. Thank you. Um, but I think it's really interesting. Just a question, you know, can 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 we ever come back to the to the qualities of a market space um, or or a bazaar? And to me, it's um, it's maybe strange because that's uh, if I take an example, concrete example, when I worked in Christchurch after the earthquake and we did this recovery plan, and the whole city center was just completely shut off. No one could use it. So there was not a meeting place in the city anymore. The first thing that happened was through the desire to meet this um, market space that started to pop out up in neighborhoods around the city centers as a way to, for people to come together, uh, but also to exchange good. It was like uh, farmers markets, but also selling other types of goods. So it was really like a multifunctional market space. And, and to me, the interesting part of this is that how quickly the market can respond to a crisis or to a change, because it is like the beauty of, of the flexibility of not having just one place, but actually being a function or a concept that can move and adapt to different places. So the need for that flexibility to, to be able to tap into also where people are. So addressing who are we designing for, if we have more of a flexible mindset about where, how to consume things or how to do things. So, so we actually make this offer uh, be paired with what we, know, what we know is the everyday life of people and be really, really focused on making sure that we know that the people that have the less um, uh, possibilities or, or, or uh, um, people that are under, under the served, underserved communities, they are so in so many ways uh, cut off from uh, possibilities to even like shop fresh food or uh, it's much harder for them to have a healthy life, lifestyle. So if we can try to think of this combination of uh, understanding people's everyday life routines knowing where people enjoy spending time already today and then inviting uh, the market space to where people are. I think that's, that's an interesting way to think of the reverse, like, like actually shopping coming to people and then addressing the social dimension at the same time. So offering not only one good, but like a lot of like this great variety of offers that invites different types of user groups. So we have this social mixing 
Thank you, Eva. I'm aware of time. So uh, Thomas and Andrew, if we can keep it to a minute so you have uh, one final round as well. Thomas, over to you. I think we are refreshed at sort of trying to get rid of uh, the bullshit somehow. I think there's something about being feeling invigorated and I, it's it's not for no reason that the uh, if I've got my double negatives or whatever that the farmers markets have have risen up I mean many markets they're not cheaper than if you buy something in a shop why is it that we are invigorated what is it that connects what is about that energy that we thrive off it's also very interesting I think that how we used to spend time outdoors only in sort of July August uh, and I know Jan Gale wrote a lot about this, but then gradually that's expanded round where we're willing, even in Helsinki, you know, in, in November, we, we're willing to be sit outside. It's like our senses want invigoration. And I think we have a, an urge for a truth. And I think within a market, there's a feeling that no one's pulling a layer over you. And I think in whatever our high streets offer now, now there's even the question, do we need the glass anymore in all of these places? And how do we make something that flexes and changes without that stiffness? So I think we're in a time of very interesting exploring our own truth and, and of each other. Thank you, Thomas. Andrew, does this resonate what we have just heard from Eva and Thomas? How, how does it land on your desk? I think the inevitable focus of the conversation towards a centrality around food um, is, is right. Uh, in fact, I would go as far as to say there will be no physical marketplace for general merchandise, in other words, you know, kind of um, manufactured consumer goods in our towns and city centres um, in, in the future. Um, there's, there's simply no customer or commercial advantage to it at scale and candidly, the internet is simply too good at meeting functional needs of that sort. Um, hence my rather glib comment about uninventing the internet because as a, as a vehicle for needs as opposed to wants and desires, it is simply too efficient and business models at scale have grown up that can service that. Um, I think then food and social interaction and emotions that centre around being together with others, both those you know and those you don't know, the affirmation that comes from sharing in a collective uh, moment in, <clears throat> in a inspiring or at least acceptably pleasant space, the, these are the fundamentals. And um, I don't think we should see that as something to fear or something to be negative around. But I do think, again, we need a realism around the version that we could get excited about with an, an Italy type marketplace that's 100,000 square feet and attracts tens of thousands of people is a great solution for a city like London or Milan or New York. It's not going to be the answer for uh, Bogner or Hull. And um, we, we need to not be too inadvertently elitist in the solutions that we reach for. Thank you, Andrew. Now, instead of me doing uh, a summary, uh, I suggest we do one final round. Uh, we'll run over by two minutes, but I hope the audience will be remaining with us. But just one sentence for uh, the four of us, so uh, of you, including Jonathan, uh, what of the debate over the last 60 minutes may stick with you? Is there, was there sort of one moment, uh, one argument, one perspective, uh, which also maybe in the framing of it, uh, you uh, sort of will, will carry forward? And I want to invite Jonathan to come first. It's a reconciliation of some points that we've heard here, you know, from Andrew, which obviously it's all about the commercial side to a large degree. You know, it's got to make it's got to make monetary sense to be able to invest in things. But equally, you know, what Thomas was saying about the emotional, I think, is also worth bringing in. And I think you can marry the two together. You know, if you think about online retail and how it's pushed forward into our psyche and consumer spend. It's been one of those things where it's hard to measure the benefit of physical stores in that context. And so what I think is important is to understand the halo effects, you know, of a physical store and what it does for online channels. And I think measuring that and monetizing that is key for retailers going forward. So they can purely evaluate not just the emotional side, but also the monetary side of things, bring the two together. Thank you. Eva. Yes, I think 
uh, if we can, we have some good numbers for that as well, actually, which is really good. Um, to me, it's all about the social dimension of shopping, to tap into that, uh, to think social dimension and place as a key driver to our habits and consumption, um, etc. So, so how can retail uh, be much more of a place making, a social catalyst for unique and authentic neighborhood? Thank you, uh, Eva uh, and Andrew. Well, I'm aware that I've probably been quite kind of cold and hard and rational through the conversation. <laughs> I'm very, I am very struck with uh, what Thomas said, and I'll slightly paraphrase um, the kind of disaggregation of design into art and function, um, and then inhabited by emotion. And I think, as as a retailer, in in our essence, most of us who spent our career in retail, that's actually what we're around about in terms of product, place, and people. And I do think the the coming together of the, the commercial animals, the operators, the designers, and the, the kind of the property owners, whether a local authority, etc. I do think that's probably the point on which we commune and where our interests align. And so I do think it's important not to lose that, albeit, as I've pointed out a number of times, that there are complexities at scale and in terms of business models in order for us to, to make the best job of that in the future. But, but that, that, that will definitely stay with me. Thank you, Andrew and Thomas. Well, I, I, I mean, everyone's made incredible points and I've, I've found this a really heartening, uh, uplifting conversation, very moving in, in many ways. And um, we've got the spookiness that I'm sitting here with a, a weirder setup than I even look like I have to have my notes around me alone in some weird biggish room in my studio. Uh, just thinking how hungry we all are to be together. And this is about togetherness and the, how we come together. We all are, want to be together. And that's a need we will always have. And these are the, about excuses to be together and how we make the emotion, the interestingness, the absence of that boringness, stimulate and invigorate ourselves and see each other, which is what I want. And I think what so many of us want. Thank you very much, Thomas. And in the spirit of emphasizing togetherness, I want to uh, express a few thanks. Uh, first of all, of course, to our audience today and really many thanks for now in total 54 comments. Have a look at them. They were all really interesting. We could only take a few. Of course, I want to thank the panel, Andrew Murphy, Eva Westermark, Thomas Heatherwick, and my co-chair, uh, Jonathan DeMello. Many thanks also to our colleagues in Berlin at the Alfred Herrhausen Society Gesellschaft that have helped prepare this debate, Elizabeth Munfeld and Alexandra Hunger, and then my own colleagues here at the LSE, Emily Cruz, Tayo Isa Daniel, Jennifer Ho, and Tian Ji. I hope you enjoyed this debate. Stay tuned, there will be more to come. And very importantly, we will of course publish not just uh, this uh, particular debate in full, but we'll produce what we call a legacy film which goes to the main arguments. Thank you so much to everyone and have a nice week.